in this study of how we are to examine ourselves to see that we're living that life that we should be living in the Holy Spirit. Which is something we need to be doing daily. Absolutely. You know, Paul says, let a man examine himself. And, and that's why we're doing this, is to kind of give us a guideline, an outline of, of how we should be examining ourselves. So, um, we last week, we, well, the first week, this is the third week, as I said, mm -hmm. We did an introduction last week. We talked about love because that is, above all, the evidence of a redeemed life. <clears throat> but today we're going to talk about joy. Uh, Hallelujah. Yeah. We like joy. We all like joy. So that's where we are. And before we start on that, I just want to thank you, Father, for the fruit of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Yes. Lord, that you have given us a new life and that we should be seeking to have that evidence of a new lifestyle. Lord, it's our desire to be living as you desire us to be. And your word is that tool that you've given us to examine all things, but to examine ourselves today, that we might just be sure that we're being living a life that's pleasing to you. Because when all is said and done, that's our goal, Lord God, is to hear you say those words, well done, our good and faithful servant. So we just praise you and thank you for this time that we have together here in Kissimmee, Florida. And you might notice that our brother, dear brother Mark, is not with us for this film. Uh, we're a little bit out of out of range for him to, to join us. He's up in Altamont Springs, and uh, here as we're filming this, that's, it's a bit too far to go with the traffic. So, but he will be joining you in watching this study. So hi, Mark. We miss you. <laughs> All right. As I said, we're studying joy. Let me just start with a verse Good. to set the stage. This is from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. We are to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher or perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. So we'll come back to that, but that needs to set the stage. Now, I want you to know because. Um, uh, there's two Greek words that are used frequently in the New Testament. One appears 59 times and it's translated 92% of the time as joy. And then there's another that is translated 94% of the 50 times that it occurs, and that's blessed. Now that word blessed is a couple of times translated as happiness. But a careful, or prayerful, better yet, study of God's Word combined with conversation with the Holy Spirit has to reveal that to the Lord there is a difference between joy, happiness, and being blessed. Now while those conditions may and frequently do coexist, they're not dependent on one another. And they represent three entirely different things. Now in the world, those get blended and confused, and I mean, even if you go to a dictionary, you're going to find where you, you really can't separate them. But God has, in his choice of words in the New Testament, he has definitely separated those things. This, that, that's a fact that the world just simply doesn't understand, because they've been blinded to the truth by the adversary, whose great desire is to steal our joy and our blessings. Now, that, that devil, he doesn't particularly care if we are momentarily happy or not. Because that's a, that's a wavering condition, right? But joy, on the other hand, is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And that is the evidence of his presence in our lives. And that is a joy that is not dependent on happy circumstances. It's a steadfast sense. Because happiness is fleeting dependent upon a person liking their current situations or circumstances. 
while joy is an unwavering attribute of a redeemed life. Were that not true, how could the Apostle Paul be possibly be true? He wrote to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 1.6, and he said, You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Tribulation and joy locked together. Okay? They, they seem like strange bedfellows. Well, that's, a, that's exactly right. And to the world, it's not comprehensible. But Paul said that. And the word demonstrates that tribulation, which is certainly unhappy circumstances, can exist side by side with the joy in our lives. Because that has nothing to do with us. That's why. It's not dependent on us. Right. It's dependent on the Holy Spirit in us. And it's not dependent on circumstances in our lives. Exactly. The prophet Jeremiah had often been called the weeping prophet, right? And not without some cause, right? He was told by the Lord when he was called into his ministry that the kings, the princes, the priests, and the people of Judah, that's the people of God, he was told by God that all of these people would fight against him. And indeed they did, right? However, the Lord had also told him that those people, the people of God in Judah, would not overcome him. For I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. That's what he said. Jeremiah 1, verses 18 and 19. Now, the Lord's warning to Jeremiah was not an idle threat, right? Now, think about this, and this is from the book of Jeremiah. In the first chapter, verses 18 and 19, it says he was opposed by his own brothers. In chapter 20, it says he was beaten and put into the stocks by a priest and by a false prophet. In verse, in chapter 37, verse 18, he was imprisoned by the king. In verse, I keep saying verse, in chapter 38, he was thrown down a well, thrown into a cistern by, by the Judean officials. In chapter 20, he's, a, he's opposed by a false prophet, one of many times, right? So he's going through all of this tribulation, all of this persecution, but in the 15th chapter of this book of Jeremiah, he cries out, listen to this now, Woe to me, my mother, that you have borne me as a man of strife and a man of contention to all the land. I have not lent, nor have men lent me money, yet everyone curses me. So here he is, he's saying, this is bad. I mean, it's like everybody curses me. Everybody in the land hated him. He felt he was standing wrong. So those are certainly not the words of a happy man. Do you agree with that? Do you agree with that? Yet in that same chapter, chapter 15, immediately after that statement, he continues on to say, Your words were found and I ate them. And your words became for me the joy and the delight of my heart. For I have been called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. 15, 16. Now he continues on to say that he did not sit in the circle of merrymakers, verse 17, and that his pain had been perpetual, verse 18. Yes. So he's talking about joy and delight at the same time that he's talking about, you know, this person has to use and hate trials and tribulations. Right. Now, so it, you know, he's not happy, right? No. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not against happiness. Ta-da. It's just that my spiritual well-being, and more relevant to this study, my joy does not rise and fall on the tide of happiness. Tides go in, they go out. You're constantly changing and shifting. But my joy is not dependent on that happiness. The pursuit of happiness has been exalted and memorialized here in the United States in the Declaration of Independence. It says that's one of the inalienable rights. It's the right to pursue of happiness. I have a question. Let me just make this statement oh. here. It has to be a pursuit because it's fleeting and transient. People are always chasing after it and rarely attain it. Now, speaking about joy and happiness, is it wrong for you to show your unhappiness when you're in a situation? Well, that's a good question. I think it would be, it would be, even if God would tolerate that, okay? Since it says we would do all things without grumbling and complaining, 
I think that our goal should be to show our joy. And, and I'll give you an example of that in a little bit, right? So just think about this. I said, you know, it's part of the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America, this inalienable right to the pursuit of happiness. But a recent Harris poll, very recent, I mean, this was this year, or this was past year, less than a year ago, they concluded that only one third of Americans are very happy. That means two thirds of all Americans are not very happy in their lives. Right? Now, there's, a, there's an institute called the Legatum Institute, and they do a lot of very, very significant and serious studies. And in one of their most recent studies, they indicated that the United States, with its inalienable right to the pursuit of happiness, does not even rank in the top 10 of happy nations. And by the way, the UK is even farther down the list. Okay? <coughs> And another thing, another, a recent article, this is from October, just a couple of months ago, a few months ago, in a science and psychiatry journal, noted that antidepressant medications are the most consumed class of drugs in the United States, with 270 million prescriptions per year. Now, think about that, because depression is the opposite of joy. Yes. Okay? <clears throat> joy lifts you up. Hallelujah. When you're depressed, it means you're being pressed down. You're being pressed down. The, the call of God in your life is not the call. His promise is to raise you up. Depression pushes you down. And yet, this is the most common thing in America. It's the most common prescription drug in America are, are antidepressants. Yes. And another interesting fact, just worthy of thought, is that even though the, the, the prices of these antidepressants are going down because of the generic medicines, right? Americans still spend close to $10 billion a year on antidepressants. I think there's a joy crisis in the United States of America. And I promise you that $10 billion could be better used than what it's being used for. Okay? We're going back shortly, well, not, well, a couple of months, few months, back to the United Kingdom. <coughs> and uh, I was reading a newspaper from the United Kingdom yesterday, mm -hmm. just yesterday, and they had done a study mm -hmm. on, well, let me, let me read this to you. They're talking, doing a study on happiness, mm -hmm. depression, mm -hmm. just so lined up co perfectly. coincidentally, yes. And here's the conclusions, and these are quotes. People who are religious are healthier and take fewer sick days, new research suggests. Mm -hmm. Just find that out. Yeah, well, you know, I, I love this. How medicine, medical experts find out every once in a while, like, I'm very important to make it through this good medicine. They just discover that every couple of years. Mm. It's once they decide to pick up a Bible. Yeah, even though Solomon said it 3,000 years ago. Okay. okay. This is another, this is a quote from, from this study. Experts believe this could be because spirituality offers a buffer against the strains of modern life. Mm. Hello. We overcome by our faith. Hallelujah. That's a good buffer. The buffer that stands between us and the unjoy of the world is called the Holy Spirit. Praise God. And it is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And that's why we need to examine our lives and see, you know, are we doing this or are we living this? Operating. And this is another direct quote from this article just yesterday. A psychologist at the Health and Safety Laboratory in Stockport, 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 England, found that the more religious a person is, the less likely they are to suffer from anxiety, depression, or exhaustion. Now, religion may be a term that I'm not real comfortable with here, because it's about relationship, not ritual, right? But these are these are true. They do these studies. They do these studies all the time. And they find this, but it's like, then okay, just blow it off and let's prescribe some more drugs. Mm. That comes from a lot of discontent. Yes. Right? People in the world are discontent. And that discontent in their lives is bred in their lives. That's what most advertising is. Most advertising is to make you unhappy with what you have, so you'll buy something new. Or make you unhappy that you don't have the newest and greatest mm -hmm. thing. Discontent. The Apostle Paul said, we have food covered with these we shall be content. To be satisfied. 
Yeah, but you know, surely you've heard the expression in the world, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence, right? It's, it's, it's like, you know, by the way, we'll get to a fruit of the Holy Spirit about jealousy. But it's like always, it's better over there than where you are. Well, the world lacks contentment, like I said. For the redeemed of the Lord, the grass is a constant place of contentment and joy because it's real. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside his quiet waters. Amen. The grass doesn't get any greener than where we are if we are living that redeemed life. Now, remember Jeremiah, right? Happiness? No. But joy? Yes. Delight? Yes. We've been told in the Word more than once that our joy is supposed to be a constant in our lives. Right? The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he says, We're sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. How can you be sorrowful and yet always rejoice? Because they're not, like I said, you're not carried about by those winds of, of the world. You know? It's whatever we're focusing on. Yeah. I mean, it's not wrong to be happy. But that's not the goal. That's it. Joy is the goal. Joy is the thing to have. He says in, to, in his letter to the Philippians, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Mm -hmm. That's a choice. This is one of the things you have to understand. Joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. If you are the redeemer of the Lord, you do have the joy of the Lord inside you, but you have to choose to express it. That's why he says to the Thessalonians again, rejoice always. And that is connected to his saying. Go read this in, in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Because the next thing now is don't punch the Holy Spirit. You're not rejoicing, you're not expressing that joy that God has given you. It will quench the Holy Spirit's work in your life. Now, I think it would be obvious to any of us who have been walking with the Lord for any time, by any time, I mean more than an hour and a half, that without the ongoing joy that demonstrates the saving work of the Lord in our lives, our lives will be filled with weakness rather than being overcomers and walking in triumph as the Lord desires that we should. And how many, you know, listen, remember the purpose of this study is to encourage us and help us to examine ourselves, to see that we are living, that there is evidence of that redemption of Jesus Christ in our lives, that we, there's evidence of this redeemed life. So part of that is be strong in the Lord and strengthen in his might. Doesn't it say that? Yes, it does. Okay. How many we Christians you know? I mean, they're always moaning and moaning and damn. Well, think about the words of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 8. The joy of the Lord is your strength. If you don't have that joy operating in your life, you're going to be a weak, overcome Christian. Not an overcomer, but overcome Christian. That's not what God desires for you. So you need this joy. Where does joy come from? Well, yes, it's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. But you've got to connect the dots here, right? John the Baptist said that his joy was made full because he had heard the voice of the bride. John 3, 29. Because he heard the voice of Jesus Christ. Because he heard the words of Jesus Christ, his joy was made full. Like Jeremiah, God's word should fill us with joy. And it is the Holy Spirit who is sent to lead us, sent to lead us into all truth, right? Who turns the written word, the scripture, into God's living word in our lives. And that's important. Because Paul wrote, and he said, he's talking about God, who made us adequate as servants of the new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. 2 Corinthians 3.6. This is where I was talking about uh, a moment ago, when I talked about the difference between, or I said that there is a difference between, you know, being religious yes. and having a relationship with God. There's a lot of people who are religious, and they have none of this evidence of their redemption or redeemed life. No, because they're living on traditions. Because they are living a dead one, mm -hmm. trying to keep the law, 
when we are under grace from God and supposed to be in a relationship with Him based on what He's done for us. And that ought to give you joy. Because the fact of the matter is, if you're trying to get to God through religious activity, you never, you no. can't do it. There's no power in religious activity. There's only power in the Word. In the Word. The Word was made flesh and dwelt right. among us. It starts there. Because God sent, the Father sent His Son Jesus Christ to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. We could never attain a relationship with God based on what we could do. It was that free gift of the Son Jesus Christ. Not a word, so that any man should boast. But this is that free gift of God. So, if you make this connection between the Word and our joy, right? Then, when we're faithfully examining our own lives, we need to see how important the Word of God is to us. Is it truly our joy and delight? I mean, Jeremiah was able to have joy and delight in the face of all this persecution because of the Word. That Word was found and I ate it. Do we find it necessary in our daily lives? Are we as diligent feeding on the Word of God as we are on feeding on natural food? When Jesus was under attack from the devil in the wilderness, right? He quoted from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 83, and he said, and it says, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That before four. I want to tell you that if you are not feeding on the, on the word of God, remember Peter said you should long for it like a newborn babe longs for the pure milk, right? If you're not feeding on that word, you're not going to have the joy that God has made available to you. You know, just thinking about that, um, because we live in such a world that everybody wants everything now, right now, this fast food generation, that when you're going through something, and you, if you go into the word to try to, to get the peace that you need, the joy, and you don't get it instantaneously, right then and there, and you and you leave it. But it's it's a working. The word works in yes. our life. And all of this, as we continue on in the study, which is by the way the fruit of the Holy Spirit. One of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, a part of the fruit of the Holy Spirit, is patience. Patience. That's right. Yes. Abraham, having patiently waited, to receive the promise. So all of these things, and that's something we're going it's to talk about. Interconnected. Well, because, well, I'll, I'll talk about that a little more, and it's absolutely interconnected. So, uh, if we're looking, we're going to examine our own lives to see if we have that, if there is that evidence of a redeemed life. One of the signs that we need to look for, one of the things that's so important, is what Jesus said that we abide in his word. John chapter 8, verse 31. He said, if you abide, continue, live in my word, then you're truly my disciples. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. There are a lot of people out there who are Christian in name only. Go look at the seven churches of Revelation if you don't think that's true. You have a name that you're alive and that you're dead. You know, because it's like you have to abide in God's word. There's no other way. You know, there's no shortcut to this. Alice has talked about we live in a fast food generation when we are accustomed to these things happening instantaneously. You know, your food will be served in less than three minutes or else. You know, we've been blessed. We've, we've traveled the world. And we've lived and we've lived out the jungle. And I just I was talking about this example because it's like we live next to uh, in one village near the village chief, a man, his wife, and, and his ten children. And in the morning when it was breakfast time, they wanted breakfast. Well, you know what? Right. They didn't know the cupboard. No, no, no. A couple of the, couple of the kids would go out into the bush to collect firewood. A couple of the girls would typically go down to the river to get water. One of the kids would go out and start a fire. I mean, it was this entire process. And then, you know, Mama would cook it at the end. We just, we just have to have it now. Patience is part of this fruit of the Holy Spirit that is the evidence of redemption in our lives, right? So you need to examine yourself. I need to examine myself. We all do. That's a point of this. We need to examine ourselves. We're so ready to examine everybody else. 
We're so we're so ready to look at everybody else. They're wrong. I don't know what I want to do. Look in the mirror. Paul says, "Let a man examine himself." That's where this has to start. Okay. Are we following this command? Peter said, "Whoever speaks is to do so as one who is speaking the utterances of God." Certainly, we are to imitate Jesus Christ. In John 12, it says, Jesus said, For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. Examine yourself. Do you believe in the promises of God? And then, do you confess God's promises? That's the truth of the I mean, this is the evidence of a redeemed life, is what's coming out of your mouth. Because you want to know something? It's about what God has done in your heart. He took that heart of stone and gave you a heart of flesh, right? And it says, out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know what I said? the abundance of the mouth. It's a good thing she's here. Oh my goodness gracious. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So you can test this. What's coming out of your mouth? Is it the promises of God? Is it those, those great words of God that give you that victory, that promise his victory? Because no promise of his promises fail to pass, come to pass, right? That's right. It's faithful. Or, and think about this. Now, remember, I'm not saying any of this for condemnation. We all need to examine ourselves. Is the fruit of your lips the worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things? Because those things, Jesus said, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Go check it out. This is the parable of the sower and seed. Jesus said, if you don't understand this, you're not going to understand anything. Mark chapter 4. Because if you're not confessing that word of God in your life, your joy is going to fly away like a little bird. Ding, gone. The source of our joy, which is the source of our strength, which empowers us to exalt in our tribulations. That's Romans 5 3. To rejoice when we suffer for his name's sake. Check out Acts chapter 5, verse 41. To give thanks in all things, 1 Thessalonians 5 18. And to count it all joy when we encounter various trials, James 1 2. If you're not confessing the word of God, you're not going to have the strength, you're not going to have the joy that comes from hearing his voice. You want to know something? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It doesn't matter whether you hear it from, from us at the Bible study, from your pastor behind the pulpit, or from yourself. Or from yourself. yourself. It is from the comes from the Word. It's not about the person delivering it. It's not about the messenger. It's about the message. So, that's what you want to do. Is you want to be able to exalt in your prayer. You want to be able to get, keep that joy constant. Joy is easy when things are going, everything's going right. But when you have tribulations, when you suffer, and you can give thanks, that's when you really want it. That's when you really need it. And that is the evidence of our redeemed life. Let me ask you a question. Okay. I'll ask you a question. Okay. If you know the account of Paul and Silas in Philippi, when they were beaten and thrown into jail, deepest, darkest part of the jail, thrown in a dungeon, chained to the wall, and if you don't know the story, go to Acts 16 and read it because you need to know the story. Because it says around midnight they're praying and they're singing praises. Praises. They're singing praises to God. They have unjustly been beaten and locked up. They're in pain. And God shook the earth. He shook the earth and it says the, the, their fetters the, flew off. Chains. The chains flew off. The bars of the cell flew open. But not just on their cell. I have all the cells around them, right? Because when God blesses you, I'm going to tell you, that blessing will overflow. It will overflow and touch everybody around you. But the jailer came up to Paul and said, what must I do to be saved? Because he was worried about being killed. When he released prisoners, all of a sudden be free. My question is, why did the jailer ask Paul, what must I do to be saved? Of the evidence of his redeemed because life. of the evidence of a redeemed life. Yes. I want to tell you something. I can promise you this. None of the other prisoners were singing praise to God. None 
none of the other prisoners were showing joy in the midst of this most horrible situation, a, hard, a situation so hard and horrible we can barely conceive of. And yet here they are rejoicing. The jailer saw something in them that set them apart from everybody else that he had ever seen. When was the last time somebody came up to you and said, what must I do to be saved? We struggle so hard to go out and share the gospel. On the day of Pentecost, the people came to them to find out what was going on because something was going on. Something different than they knew or understood or experienced was going on. There should be something in your life that the people out in the world have not experienced, don't understand, and they need to come and say to you, how can this be? And you'll say, because of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I've said that the fruit of the Holy Spirit is a fruit. Yes. It's not nine fruits. It is a fruit. It's kind of like a jewel with many facets, right? They're inseparable. This joy that we're talking about is indelibly linked to the following fruit, the peace. Right? Yes. And by the way, you lose one, you're going to lose them all. That's right. It's not like, it's not like you can lose the banana. Right. And it's funny because when I was working, I used to, when my mother was still alive, I talked to her every day from work. And I remember what she was saying, and I remember one morning talking with her, she sounded kind of down. I said, what's the matter? And she said, I just lost all my fruits. <laughs> she had gotten upset about something, and she knew that because of that one was gone, all well, of them all gone. Gone. That's, that's true. Okay. So if you lose your joy, you're not going to have peace. And if you don't have peace, I promise you, you're not going to have joy. And if you don't have love, that first one, you're not going to have anything. Okay? You're it's only one fruit. We're going to look at peace in our next episode. But before we do that, before I close, there's a great example that I want to share here. One that you may already know. That, that will be our bridge between the two. And it's surely an example of all of this. Okay? Um, in, the, in the 1800s, there was a man who lived in Chicago, a Christian man. He was a lawyer. He was a businessman. His name was Horatio Spafford. He had a son who died in 1871. He had five children at that point, four daughters and a son, and the son died. For any parent would know that's a tragic event. I mean, that, you know, that's difficult to get over. Losing anyone. But then in 1871 came the Great Chicago Fire. And that Great Chicago Fire destroyed and virtually bankrupted this man because he was so heavily invested in, in real estate in Chicago. It was all gone, up in a cup of smoke. So it, it, it just ruined him financially. Then in 1873, he was going on a trip with his wife and his four daughters to go over to Europe. And at the last moment, of course, in those days, the only way to go was by ship. And just before they left, an issue came up that was still attached to the Great Fire in Chicago and his investments. And he had to stay behind, and I guess he had planned on going over to meet them later. So they got on the ship and they were going to overseas. And while they were traveling overseas, they had a collision with another vessel. And the ship they were on, a, a French ship, sank just in moments. And 226 people Dying, which was the vast majority of people on board. Safford's wife, Anna, survived, but the four daughters perished at sea in that, in that accident. His wife, Anna, reached Cardiff in Wales and sent, because of course this made news, even back then, news traveled slowly, but it made the news. He knew something had happened. And his wife sent him a cable and telegram. And it started with these words, save alone. Mm -hmm. She survived and the daughters, the four daughters did not. So Stafford got on another ship to go over to get his grieving wife. And as he was traveling across the Atlantic, it was noted that they came to a place where this accident had happened, where his four daughters, all of his children, perished. 
And as I was passing that point, he wrote the words to a hymn. And that hymn has touched and blessed so many people in the years since. And I just want to share the beginning words of that. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my life thou hast taught me to know, it is well, it is well with my soul. That was not a happy time or a happy place. But there was something inside of him. And then something inside of him was the Holy Ghost. Just bring it up. Absolutely. Give you what you need at that moment. Yes. And he said, it is well with my soul. So often today we sing these songs and they have no meaning to us. And so many of them came out of these mighty testimonies of the saints of God. That was the evidence of the new life. Yes. That was the evidence of joy that is unshakable. That was the evidence, that was peace that the world can't give. Jesus said that in John 14. He said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. That was peace that passes all understanding. Because Paul wrote to the Philippians and said, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That is peace that is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and that is truly evidence of a redeemed life. I need to examine myself, and you need to examine yourself, and make sure that people can see in us the living God. Because we are a fragrant aroma bringing the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus in every place. And when you do that, I promise you, your joy will be made full. So Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you that it's not something we have to struggle for, but it's something that you have placed within us. It is something that your Holy Spirit that you have placed within us is bearing in our lives, bringing forth in our lives. We thank you that we have a joy and a peace and a love that is not bound to circumstance, but the Lord is bound to you. I thank you, Lord God, that, that you, who are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the root and the offspring, Lord, that you are both our trip and our destination. And Lord, that we would keep our minds set on what awaits us, Lord God, and that our joy would be unshakable, that there would be in our lives that evidence of your work in our lives, and that people would come to us and say, what must I do to have that? We just thank you, Father. And I thank you for being with us again. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Hallelujah. So. Until next time, I know that Alice wants to remind you as always. Jesus loves you. A lot. So until next time, may the Lord our God bless you and use you for the glory of his name.